I was wondering if you could speak a little to balancing the stewardship of your children and not harboring bitterness in their hearts with sacrifice for the Lord and being gone a lot. That's a great question. Okay. Um, and it reveals the idolatry, the narcissistic idolatry of, of men in the ministry. Okay. How many times have we heard, you know, I had to sacrifice so much for my family to do God's will. Um, if you've ever said that, you really need to go before the Lord and repent because he's going to call you on the carpet. Because what you've done is you've accused him. You've accused God. In the book of Romans, chapter 12, it describes the will of God, that which is good, acceptable, and perfect. Now, um, a lot of times in our mind, analytically, when we see, you know, good, acceptable, and perfect, then we try to find these nuanced definitions of each of those terms. It's like when the Lord says, you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then people try to make, they dissect those things when actually in Hebrew, the Hebrew idea is just piling one term upon another to say, you must love the Lord your God with everything you are. Okay, he's not dividing the human psyche there just with everything you are. Okay, so here, these terms are nuanced, each one, but they also influence the other. They're, they're together. And this idea, the will of God is perfect. What does that mean? In order to fulfill the will of God in this area of my life, there is never need for me to violate the will of God in this area of my life. And let me give you an illustration everyone will understand. A young girl who's really not, she's Christian, but she's really not been really involved in evangelism, all of a sudden sees a guy who is lost but looks like Brad Pitt, and immediately she becomes a flaming evangelist. And she says, I, I, you know, I'm going to date this guy to win him to Christ, and you're going, you're trying to fulfill the will of God by breaking the will of God, you know? Well, we need to turn that back on us as ministers and even as, you know, just men. So, do I really want to do the will of God, or do I really want to grow a ministry? And you say, well, it's not that I want to grow a ministry, it's just this ministry needs me so much. Really? You're that important, hey? It needs you that much. So I want you to look at something. I'm going to use an illustration from my life. So, I thought I was going to be a single missionary for like ever. I went to Peru. I wanted to be the Apostle Paul of the Andes, and my hope was to die as a martyr. So I had it all planned out. I read too many missionary biographies. So if I wanted to work 18 hours a day, if I wanted to be involved in, in prayer, fasting, reading of Scripture, evangelizing, and pastoring for 18 hours a day, it's like, go ahead. Knock yourself out. Because there are so many commands in Scripture, Brother Paul, that are dead to you and you're dead to them. For example, all the commands of Scripture from Genesis to Revelation on the responsibility of a husband toward his wife. Every one of those were dead to me and I was dead to them. So if I wanted to do this over here, go for it. But now the moment I took a wife, all those commandments that were dead to me are now alive to me. And I'm alive to them. And as you know, obedience requires time. So that means these 18 hours or 16 hours, to be biblical, these hours of soul winning, of going up in jungles and stuff like that, some of this needs to now be allocated to what? To the care of this woman biblically. And if I go, yeah, but I don't have time, then we're, we're, automatically we're seeing my heart, right? I'm really, not, I'm really not concerned about the Lord either. It's not that I love the Lord more than I do my wife. It's that I love me more than I love my wife and the Lord. Do you see that? 
Because the, the whole thing is just to be obedient. That's all that's required of a steward. So if he brings his daughter, notice I didn't say a woman, I said his daughter. I have daughters. And I'm kind of the guy, like the guy said, you know, when my son was born, I looked down and I realized there's someone I could die for. When my daughter was born, I looked down and, and realized there's someone I could kill for. God has given me his daughter. And to go, no. It's saying so much, not about my devotion to God, but my devotion to me. And so this has to be allocated to her. It has to be allocated to her. And you say, but the work is so great. Right now, we've just had to pull 800 orphans out of a war zone. The first driver that went in that we sent in was killed. His truck was burned alive. And now we've got him in a certain place and it's been flooded and all the orphans have been scattered. Don't think that weighs on my mind, but I still have a daughter of Christ, a daughter of God to take care of. And I can't fix this problem anyways. And so you allocate that time. But then it was Chato, my wife and I, running around the Andes and the jungle. We were Batman and Robin. We didn't have a care in the world. It was, it was amazing. I mean, we were together all the time. If I traveled, she traveled, unless it was a zone where it was just too dangerous. We were the, all together. And then what happened? Well, there were a bunch of commandments that were dead to both of us. We were told we could never have children. Then eight years later, this gigantic creature is born. A time sucker, a life sucker. You know. And guess what? Those commandments that were dead to Chato and I now came alive. And so now I'm not going to go into the jungle as often. Chato's not. But is she now, is she stopped being this superhero woman of God? Well, a superhuman woman of God or man of God is just someone who obeys God and whatever he's put in front of them. Do you realize there are going to be men who did extraordinary things on the mission field, but in heaven are not going to be promoted that high? Because it's not about doing extraordinary things in the ministry. It's about being obedient. And I can't imagine anything worse than you were obedient in all these things that made you look good, but you neglected my daughter. You neglected my children that I gave you. They were my life. I brought them into being. And so what you have to do is just break the paradigm. It's not like this struggle. It's just simply find out what are the commands of God and then devote yourself to them rather than the ministry. But I guarantee if you do this part, there will be a great deal of fruit in your ministry. And I can tell you, these things have exposed the idolatry in my heart so often. Or a reputation. Our desire to have a reputation, our desire to do something great. And, and so that's the way I look at it. But now let me share with the pastor something. You have to teach this to your church. So and, and you, so. There are times when the church will call me and say, you know, we're looking for a pastor. Can you give us some advice? And I'll, of course, I'll go through, you know, 1 Timothy 3, Titus 1, different things. But this is what I'll do. I'll ask them for a whiteboard. And I'll go, okay, so you want a pastor? Yes. Okay. How many days a week do you want him to work? Seven? Five? Six, well, you know, Brother Paul, you know, five and a half in there, six. Okay, how many hours a day do you want him to work? 24? 18? They say, well, you know, 10? 10 hours? Okay. How many 
hours a day do you, of those 10 hours do you want him studying the Bible and preparing sermons that are going to affect the eternal destiny of your children? See, they don't think that way because they've not been taught to think that way. And they'll say, well, I go a half hour? No. Well, how much? And they'll usually say like, well, three, four hours a day? Okay. Now, how many hours a day do you want him interceding for your children and your marriage? And, and then they go, well, you know, I go five minutes. Well, no, you know, an hour or an hour and a half. Okay. What do you want him to do with the rest of his time? Do you want him to counsel? And, and what happens is members, oftentimes, when they don't see what the pastor should be doing, when they're not showed biblically what the pastor should be doing, they have all these crazy ideas. But if you just show them that the principal task of the pastor is the proclamation of the word, exposition in the pulpit, exposition, you know, behind the counselor's chair. When the pastor goes into a deacon's meeting, do you know the only reason he should be in there? The exposition of biblical principles to guide men who know finances and other things better than him, but he knows how they ought to be guided in the word. So the pastor is expositing, expositing, and the people need to know this is his job. And you can begin to order the church. Now, one last thing I want to say, because I'm not, you know, I'm not an academic. I wish I was smarter. Um, I, I look at things quite maybe simpleton. I always ask this question. Someone says, well, I'm a pastor. And I go, OK, um, when you went through Genesis to Revelation and pulled out every text in the Bible that has to do with a command to pastors, a description to pastors and so on and so forth. What did you come up with? And they said, well, I've never done that. I've read this book never. and I go, but. You're going to stand before God one day. Wouldn't it be wise to go through the entire Bible and find every command he gives to a pastor and then ask yourself, keep that in front of you constantly. Every, every ethic that he gives to a pastor, every qualification, every duty. And then you look at that and that's how you guide your life. By looking at as a steward, what were you commanded to do? It's the same way with a husband. OK. From Adam all the way to the end, and also especially looking at the, the last Adam and the way he deals with his bride and all the commands give, okay, I've, I've put them all together here, and now I can see, oh, I'm supposed to do this, I'm supposed to do this, I'm supposed to do this, I'm supposed to have this quality. See, it's, it's actually quite simple, isn't it? But very few people ever get to that point where they actually do that. They'll read the best book on what it means to be an elder. They'll read, you know, the reformed pastor. They'll do this. But just to go in the book and just literally list every command of a pastor, every virtue of a pastor. I'm doing that right now with regard to an evangelist. I did it before, but I thought I need to go through this in a much greater detail. And it's amazing what happens. And you start looking at, OK, that's a direct command and I'm not doing it. That is a a virtue I'm supposed to have, and I'm weak. Also, to be able to take all those commands and show it to your church, this is the responsibility of a pastor, according to Scripture. And so these are just things I wanted to drop off. And I'm sorry for being so brash and quick, but I've got to run to Buffalo, and I wanted to shake up your world a little bit. So God bless you.